friends, it's a beautiful Tuesday outside, um, which means that it's the perfect time to listen to Doable Discipleship. This is a Saddleback Church podcast designed to help you deepen your faith, or as Linda is going to say in her most cheery voice, it's the show that helps you grow. See, how do you not just have a smile when you hear that? My name is Jason. This is Linda. And um, we are in the middle of this series now on trust that we are doing. We started this series last week and started just kind of giving an overview of, of like, where are we at as a people, as, as a society, when we're talking about this concept of trust? Who do we trust? Why do we trust it? And all these different things. And then ultimately going back to, okay, what does the Bible say about trust? And that's where we're going mm-hmm. to in this episode today, talking about how the Bible is the ultimate source of truth. And so how do we then go back to trusting it and look to um, it to guide our decision-making, our discernment uh, when it comes to trust? So we thought no better person to have on an episode like this than a Pastor Tom Holliday, uh, who, for those of you who may not be familiar, he is the Senior Associate Pastor at Saddleback Church. He is a teaching pastor here. And um, he is an expert on all things related to the Bible. Um, he, he and Kay Warren wrote our doctrinal class at Saddleback Church called Foundations, which we've talked about a bunch on the show before. He's been on the podcast a bunch. He's a familiar friend of the show. So uh, we will be joined uh, by Pastor Tom right now. Tom, thank you for being back. You are a doable discipleship regular now. I think this is like your, <laughs> I don't know, fifth or something like that appearance on the show. Always, always thank, thankful to have you join us. Well, remember, I, you know, I've been at Saddleback Church for 30 years, but my first 10 <laughs> years was as pastor of discipleship or pastor That's of right. maturity. So right. it's always in my heart. It's kind of like the perfect, yeah, it's like the perfect, yeah. okay, we should bring back Tom. It's, it's, it's yes. the best. Yes. <laughs> um, so Tom, We're having this conversation about trust, and we wanted to kind of just go back to the drawing board a little bit and and start with the idea of the Bible being the ultimate source of truth. So so as Christians, why do we say that the Bible is the ultimate source of truth? Well, I I think some people that are listening have um, taken foundations, which is our study of uh, the basic truths about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, and also about the Bible. And uh, so in that, we take like two hours to talk through this, and we're just going <laughs> to yeah. mention it here very, very briefly. Uh, but th- there is, uh, people say, why should I trust the Bible? I mean, we're going to talk about trusting the Bible through this entire session together. So if I don't trust the Bible, then talking about trust in the Bible doesn't make any sense at all. Mm-hmm. And when you start to look at the, the, the proofs of, of the Bible being an historical and accurate book, there's many, many proofs. There's four major proofs uh, for any, any believer and follower of Christ to understand about Bible's trustworthiness. There's external proofs. There's internal proofs. There are um, the, the proofs that come out of the history of how people have used the Bible, the personal proofs. And there's also how Jesus talked about the Bible, uh, which st- it starts really with you can even look outside of the Bible and see that it's an historical book. By mm-hmm. all the proofs of a book being historical, which go back to was Caesar's writing historical, was Shakespeare's writing historical. I mean, you, you can go back a little bit or a long ways. And they, by all those proofs, the Bible stands the test very, very, very clearly. And so it's not just something somebody wrote up 20 years ago and we're trying to tr- <laughs> trust in today. People have trusted these truths for thousands of years. And I, I see some people today, uh, when they talk about trust, they seem to sort of, they pull up the anchors in a way, and they act like, well, those things can't be true that have been true for thousands of years. And that just means you're probably thinking emotionally and um, not taking the time to really think through spiritually. Uh, I'm not just talking about logically, mm-hmm. I'm talking about think through spiritually, uh, mm-hmm. what these truths are all about. And so we're not going to go into all those four proofs a lot. You can go online actually and watch for free uh, the studies on the Bible and in, in foundations, and it might be helpful to you as a, as a refresher or a reminder, or maybe listening to them for the first time. Uh, but I would like to, when, when you talk about trust in the Bible as a source of truth, 
I think there's a I think there's a couple of verses that it's really good to take a look at again. Uh, I think everybody's very familiar with 2 Timothy 3.16, hmm. uh, or many of people listening now are, which says all scripture is inspired by God. And it's useful to teach us what's true and make us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when, when we're wrong. It teaches us to do what's right. So that phrase, all scripture is inspired, it means literally God breathed. In fact, a lot of translations translate it, all scripture is God breathed. So why do we trust the Bible? Because it's it's God breathed. Mm -hmm. God breathed into even the writers of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And when he breathed in that truth, then he wants to breathe it into our lives. And both things have to happen. You know, we have, the scripture is inspired by God, but then we have to be inspired. God has to breathe into us to let his truth be known in our lives. And that, that scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 3.16, is probably the most familiar scripture about inspiration. A less familiar one is 2 Peter 1, 16 to 21. But it's really worth remembering about why we trust the Bible. Uh, Peter, you remember the apostle of Jesus, the follower of Jesus, later in his life writes, we did not follow cleverly invented stories right. when we mm -hmm. told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received honor and glory from the God the Father when the voice came down to him from the majestic glory, saying, this is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Remember, Peter was on the Mount of Transfiguration when this happened. Mm -hmm. He heard the voice. He, he, he experienced this, and he's sharing it with us now. We ourselves mm -hmm. heard this voice that came from heaven. We mm -hmm. were with him on that sacred mountain, yeah. he says in verse 18. And then verse 19, and we have the word of the prophets made more certain. And you would do well to pay attention to it as a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts. He's talking about the end of time, the second coming of Jesus. Above all, listen to what he says in verse 20. You must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For, for prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Well, there's the key. The Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. God's mm -hmm. Spirit breathed into this book so that God could breathe into our lives. So that's why we say that we trust the Bible as the ultimate source of truth, because the Lord gave it to us through his Holy mm -hmm. Spirit, and, the, and God wants to give into our lives through his Holy Spirit yeah. through the Scripture. I know that was a lot. I didn't even give you guys a chance to talk, but no, it's probably please. A, good, no, it's, it's a good place please, to start. Right. Please, the <laughs> listeners want to be listening to you, Tom. This is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so as I was thinking about what you're saying, I know it's... Sometimes it's easy as you hear it to go, yes, that's true. And I believe that. But there's a difference between sort of the intellectual agreement, right? Believing that it's true, but actually trusting it and living our lives according to it. That looks different. So what does it really look like to, when I say that I trust the Bible, what does that mean? That's different than just kind of agreeing that what it says is good. There's more to it than that. What does that look like? I, it looks like so many things. It's hard to put your finger on just one because at different times, you know, it looks like I'm standing on a rock. I have this security in my life. At other mm. times, it feels like I'm soaring. I have this freedom in my life. So it looks like many different things. I, I think a great picture for people to think about right now, when we talk about God breathed. So if I'm trusting the Bible, that means God's breathing something into my life. Mm. Mm -hmm. I love that. And most of us, when we think of that picture, we think of creation, you know, God's word, God spoke, God breathed mm -hmm. into creation. And look at what we have, look at the beauty that we have, even in a fallen creation that we live in, we can see the beauty of what God created. And the sense that God wants to create something in your life. He wants to create something new in your life. If anyone's in Christ Jesus, he's a new creation. The old mm -hmm. things are gone, new things have come. And so is God doing something new in your life? Mm. Is God doing something new in your heart? Uh, do, do you find new ways to love? Do you find new ways to resist temptation? Do you find new ways to say yes to God in ministry? Are you finding new ways that he's developing you as a person? It's not ever as fast as we want or as instant as we want. <laughs> That's yeah. for sure. But it, it, it's new. You can sense that. And I, I find in my Christian life, I think a lot of people find this, 
and would agree with me, there's times when you don't feel new at all. It just mm. all feels old and rote and routine. And I'm doing the same thing again and again. And that's a reminder. I, I need to return to my trust in God's word because, because I, I really believe in God's word. And when it says he's going to do something new in me, I believe that. So if something new isn't happening. Why is that? You know, mm. and, and there, with everything in life, there could be a lot of reasons. You know, when, when somebody says, I feel worn out and tired in the Christian life, the first thing I always say to them is, well, maybe you're physically worn out and tired. Let's check that first. You <laughs> yeah. know, have maybe you been you need getting a nap. sleep? Have you been? <laughs> and they'll say, oh, no, I've been sleeping for months. Well, let's get that fixed first before you start trying to fix a, a physical problem with like, I'm going to stay up all night and read the Bible and that's going to fix it. That's just going to make mm -hmm. it worse in that case. So there are always lots of causes for problems. But I, I think one of the things we really need to check in our lives when it comes to feeling tired, worn out, not getting anything new out of God's word, uh, is this sense of, of trust that God wants to create something in me and begin to look towards that again. Ask God for that. Put yourself in, in a place where God can do those kinds of things in your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it, you mentioned foundations earlier, Tom. And, and again, we, we, we've talked about foundations a bunch on this show. Check it out. <laughs> um, but it, it says in in Bible part one, it says, I can trust the Bible above my feelings, my values, opinions, and culture. And I can I can appreciate somebody who reads that and thinks that it says, uh, you know, I can tr I should trust the Bible above what makes sense to me, right? Above what seems rational or practical or maybe above what my parents or mentors have taught me above what I've always thought to be. So it just, it, it, I, I can, I can understand the person, appreciate the person who may hear that and just think, okay, what you're asking me to do in trusting the Bible above these things, above everything that I've always trusted, it is to completely shift the way that I think in the way that I, I think about what I trust or how I develop my thought process or my thinking. So, so practically, how, how can you encourage somebody to do this? What does this look like? Well, maybe a longer answer to that would be, you know, if you, if you see life in like three levels and the, the top level is our actions, what we do, mm. there's a level below that, which is why we do what we do. And honestly, it's our feelings. It's our emotions. We all like to think we're logical human beings and, you know, we like we're like a computer and we add everything up uh, more than we like to admit many, many, if not most of our actions come out of our emotions. Now, it doesn't mean I always do what I feel like doing. There's a good emotion. Like, I don't feel like going to church sometimes. I admit it. I'm a pastor, but I still don't feel like going to church sometimes. But there's still a good feeling that I have about going to church when I don't feel like going to church because I know I'm doing the right thing. I don't feel bad about myself that I went to church when I didn't feel like it. I feel good about myself. So why is that? Well, there's a you've got actions, you've got those feelings, and below that, you've got your values. And that's really the core of why you do what you do, is the values that you have. And what we need to realize is that our values, for many of us, are not based, are not biblically based. Mm. Uh, they are based on the emotions that I've had all of my life. And they are based on the other people around me and what they're saying. And more than any of us want to admit, our values are based on our culture. And we can mm -hmm. see it if we look back 200 years at a different culture. You know, mm -hmm. if we look at uh, France during their independence and we see their values, or we, we look back at the Middle Ages and we see the values in, in, the, in, in the cultures that were there where you had a king and lords and they were causing everybody to serve underneath them. And there were certain values people had in that societal structure. We can see it really clearly if we look back. It's really hard to see in our own culture. Mm -hmm. But even though we can't see it, it's good to admit it. Mm -hmm. It's just good to admit it to ourselves mm -hmm. that everything I'm thinking, what we tend to think is what I think is true. And one of the one of the great wake ups, <laughs> one of the great wake up moments in life is guess what? What I think is not always true. Right. Even people that are very rational, uh, not crazy people, not people that are going to get thrown in prison next week, not people that are out, <laughs> you know, making their life work with drugs or whatever. But you feel like I'm just a normal citizen. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm OK. <laughs> but everything I think isn't right. 
Mm-hmm. And there's a reason for that because I grew up in a world where there's a lot of people around me who are thinking wrong things, wrong values. Their values are attached to money or their values are attached to popularity or uh, their values are attached to their own ego and building themselves up with others. Mm-hmm. And so I I have to say, I I can't always see why my values might be off, but being able to have the humility to admit mm-hmm. that my values are not always right. And then I need another source to check to mm-hmm. make sure I'm right. Otherwise I just go on through life trusting myself. And that is, that's a recipe for disaster. There's a way that seems, seem, Proverbs says there's a way that seems right to a man or woman, but the end of that way is actually death. And yeah. I have discovered the truth of how wrong I can be too many times in life. Now that I'm a little bit older, <laughs> to, uh, it, it starts to give you some humility, which is a good thing. And then out of that humility, you think, okay, well, what can I trust? And mm-hmm. it gives you this wonderful sense of trust in God's word that there is something that's greater than all those things in my life. I'm not just a victim of my circumstances or, or mm-hmm. my culture mm-hmm. or what happened in my family as I grew up. There, there is something greater than that that can speak into my heart and life. Well, and it seems like there's such an opportunity for, you mentioned earlier the anchors, right? And how sometimes we pull up those anchors, right? But if we're honest with ourselves, we can, we know that culture changes is always in flux. It always adapts, right? So, you know, so if we base our values in the values of culture, those will be changing and those will be in flux. So, but I think if we're honest with ourselves, what we truly desire and yearn, and I think, you know, that's how God made us is to have something that is a little bit, that is more concrete, as firmly yes, we can yes. base our values I, I was, on. I was mm-hmm. reading a news story just this morning about the Millennium Tower in San Francisco, mm-hmm. which I don't know if you've read about this. It's starting mm-hmm. to lean. Oh, okay. Oh, no. it's, 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 <laughs> that doesn't it's, sound good. <laughs> no, no, not for a high rise. Not for, <laughs> so it's leaned like, you know, seven or eight inches at the top, which is not very much. You could never see it by, you know, you'd never notice it. Yeah, sure. That seems but significant. They're, they're concerned. So they've started to try. It, it wasn't anchored to the bedrock. Mm. They put in a lot of anchors, but they didn't go all the way to the bedrock. So now mm. they're now they're going back and they're putting in new anchors that go all the way to the bedrock. But guess what happened when they started to put in some of those new anchors? The tower started to lean faster because they were messing with the, the foundation. Mm. So it leaned ah. more. How it, I'm going I'm to use an illustration that's that's not about skyscrapers, <laughs> but it's about us as human beings. Uh, sometimes when you try to put your anchor all the way to the bedrock, it does make things feel a little more shaky for you as a human being Mm. for a little bit. Like, wait, Mm -hmm. what can I trust? You just feel that for a few moments. It gets a little scary, you know, when you're digging all the way to the bedrock, because sometimes you have to dig through some really tough old stuff that you believe you've really hung on to. It was your comfort. These beliefs Mm -hmm. became Mm -hmm. your comfort. And, you know, you, you can think again, it's always easier to see this in other people. We all know other people who, some superstition has become their comfort, you know, Yeah. Uh, like, you know, to use something that nobody would use anymore. Is, you know, you always have to, the person who always has to have a rabbit's foot in their pocket, or they think <laughs> that the day is going to go bad. You know, you think, well, that's silly. We all have silly stuff in our lives. Sure. And the, the, the Christian, the Christian life of trust is this process of God continually digging through the shallower soil to get to the bedrock of his truth. But that mm. makes us feel a little shaky sometimes. Because we got to let go of some old stuff in order to grab on to the new stuff, but it's mm-hmm. worth it. It's worth it because eventually you're going to get to the bedrock. Uh, in, in in our day, there's a lot of um, not bedrock things that people are trusting in, and yeah. I think the first one people think about is politics today. That's the easy one, but man, there's a lot of other ones. Mm-hmm. There's a lot mm-hmm. of other people out there who are claiming to be sources of truth in our mm-hmm. lives that are not the right source of truth and. And some of them are easily distinguished by Christians. Others are not. And right. there might be some hard work some of us have to do to dig through the bedrock of, let me just say it this way, trusting in another human being mm-hmm. rather than trusting in the Lord Almighty. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you have to dig through the bedrock as a young Christian of trusting in the first pastor you had. Sure. You think, you think mm-hmm. he, she can do no wrong. You yep. just think there. And then eventually one day you realize, wait a minute. They're a fallible human being like I am. Mm -hmm. And as a new believer, you put all your trust in that first pastor that you had, Mm -hmm. and you have to dig through Mm -hmm. that rock and get to the bedrock of, no, my trust is in God and his word, not in that person. Yeah. 
Yeah. So as we learn to to go to God's word as our source of truth, you know, there's things that that we come to that are easier to accept and do. Love your neighbor. That one's pretty easy. But then there's times when we come to it and we're like, love your enemy. I don't know about that one. And, you know, <laughs> Pastor Rick has said many times, you know, you believe the parts of the Bible you do. He said that many, many times. Augustine said it this way, it comes out of the foundations book as well. If you believe what you like in the gospel and reject what you don't like, it's not the gospel you believe, but yourself. And so when we say that we're trusting the Bible, it means that we're, you know, putting like what you've been talking, we're putting into practice all of these things that, that God's word is telling us. But the, the flip side of that is when we say, yes, I believe the Bible, absolutely. But then we see that we're acting in ways that are contrary to what it says. Like, what is that revealing about what's happening inside us when we're saying, nope, I believe everything that the Bible says, but then our lives don't line up. What is that revealing about where, where our identity lies, where we're attached? Where does that, what does that say about us? Ooh, there's a lot to say about that. <laughs> I, uh... I knew there would be. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, you know, when you look at us as, as uh, the way we re respond to things and the way we respond to life as, as human beings, uh, one of the truths about all of us that we have to struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis is this revelation of the fact that we can't do it on our own power. Mm. There are a lot of things, when you read the Bible, there are a lot of things you think you can do and probably you can do on your own power like, don't murder. I think I can accomplish that today. You know, I think I can, I think I can not murder somebody today. Uh, or even things like there's a lot of things in Proverbs, a lot of principles in Proverbs. Okay, save money. I think I think I can do that. Uh, even try to control my tongue. Well, I might be okay at that. Well, not so great. <laughs> but then there are all these principles in the word that God gives us that remind us that that is not what he's challenging in our lives. Mm -hmm. The Bible's not a book of principles that make my life better. It's a book that shows us how to live out the power of a Holy Spirit controlled life mm -hmm. so that I can, my life can be more godly. And, uh, you know, uh, my favorite, I think, illustration of this is when Peter, one of the disciples went to Jesus and said, how, how many times should I forgive my brother up mm -hmm. to seven mm -hmm. times, which was like three times was the most you were supposed to forgive in that day. Seven times he doubled it and added one. Like, yeah, says, I'm willing to for do good more. measure. <laughs> and that's as much as he thought he could do by his human power, seven times. Mm. And Jesus said, No, 70 times seven. Now he didn't actually, he meant this infinite, this number that was above and beyond his thinking. And what he was saying is, I, I, I liken it to a high bar. And Peter says, Set it at seven feet. And Jesus says, No, set it at seven miles. Mm. And he's going, I can't. I can't do that. I can't jump over that. And Jesus is saying, what Jesus is saying in this is, that's the point. Mm. You needed a power outside of yourself to do this. And so we can get fooled in the Bible to thinking, okay, these are the parts I can do. Okay, those parts I'm going to leave out because I can't do those on my own power. <laughs> and we're totally missing the point. Mm. The point is so that we can't do these things by our own power. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I try to live the self-powered life like a lot of you who are listening right now too many times. You know, what can I get done today? What can I accomplish today? And the reason I do, to be honest, is then it's in my control mm -hmm. that I'm holding on to it. Okay, God, this is what I'm going to do for you today. If I, if I try to live, if I decide to live the spirit-powered life and say, God, what do you want me to do today? He might ask mm -hmm. me to do something I don't feel like I can do. He might ask me to do something that scares me. He might ask me to do something that's above and, and beyond my thinking. Or he might ask me to do something I never wanted to do that feels too humbling to do. All of a sudden, it's not in my control anymore. And that is the, that is the moment that God's working for in all of our lives, the trust wow. moment. Who's going to be in control? Am I in control or is he in control? Mm. So one of the things that we've talked about, a lot on this podcast recently, especially in these different series, is, is we've taken these topics and talked about attachment theory and identity and just talked about how how we we naturally will gravitate and form attachments to that which uh, we feel known by, that which right. we feel loved by and seen by. And we start to create an identity around those things. So we start to, you know, it, it, 
think about ourselves in these areas. And we, and then um, in our conversation last week, we talked about trust and how, how we, a lot of what we then trust can come from that, which we form attachments to. Right. So I, I, um, how, how do we tie these two things back together? What does what we think about the Bible say about what we think about ourselves in, in that sense and in how we form the, that trust piece? Well, the Bible very clearly talks about our identity coming from our relationship with Christ mm -hmm. and who we are in Jesus Christ. But as you talk, Jason, about attachments, uh, a difficult word to use with that, but let's just be honest about it. Let's just get everything out in the open is oftentimes our attachments are our idols. Mm. They are the things that we have made idols of in our lives that make us feel better about ourselves. And um, an idol is anything outside of God that you're trusting in to lead and guide your life, to give you the mm -hmm. strength for life that you need. And bad things obviously can be idols. It's easy to talk about how people make idols of money. That's the easiest one, probably, because Jesus mm -hmm. talked about the idol of mammon. You know, you can't trust both God and mammon. You can't trust a God and an idol at the same time. Uh, good things can also become idols. Mm -hmm. That's the hard part. Uh, you can make an idol of having your family always be happy and fine. That's mm -hmm. my idol. In fact, mm -hmm. I know, honestly, I know some people who the reason they're coming to church is they're making this deal with God. God, I'll come to church if nothing bad ever happens to my family. Mm. And I've, I, I know that because I've talked to them after something bad happened to their family. And they mm. feel like God didn't keep his agreement. God never made that agreement. God tells us that bad things happen to all of us in this world. And wow. I hate to say it, sometimes that's going to be in our own families. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do believe that when you trust Christ, you're putting your family in a more secure place. I do believe that by trusting in Christ, you're teaching your kids some principles that are going to give them a happier life and a safer life. I do believe, based not just on my feelings, but on statistics, that worship makes you a healthier person, that there are many, many good practical benefits to follow in the Lord. But the guarantee that nothing bad will ever happen to me because I'm coming to church is, a, is an idol mm -hmm. that some people have. Wow. And uh, that idol keeps them from trusting God. Because really, they're not coming to church to trust God. They're coming to church to get what they want. Mm -hmm. I'm using mm -hmm. God to get what I want. Talk about the definition of an idol. I'm using God to get what I want. Well, we're talking about trusting God through the Bible. I hate to tell you this. Some people make an idol of the Bible. Mm. They even make mm. an idol out of the Bible. You know, if I read certain verses at the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, if I do these certain practices, then God's going to have to bless me financially. God's going to have to do this for me or that for me. Mm. But they don't really listen to the verses they're reading. They're just doing a practice that they think guarantees that God has to do what they want. You know, it's mm -hmm. this deal between them and God. Mm. And God doesn't make deals. God's <laughs> the Lord and sovereign ruler <laughs> of the universe. And the deal with God is that we love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the deal. Mm. And that's the one that's going to give you the joy that you need. That's the one that's going to give you the life that he wants to give you. So you, you just come to him with open hands rather than God, here's the contract. Let's, you know, sign this together. <laughs> I, I wanted to step back in and talk about. So, so, so what I'm saying is you can't oh, have like a prenup when you become a Christian. Yeah. <laughs> it that way. Sorry, God. The... <laughs> but but it's also it's also a great reminder, Tom. And the stuff that you were talking about about idols and how how oftentimes we we form our attachments to idols. That's 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 such a great reminder and something for everybody to be thinking about because. Mm -hmm. Because we see pretty clearly in the Bible what happens to idols is they can get burned up <laughs> pretty quick. <laughs> God will burn them up. And what I'm, what I'm saying in that, so nobody feels like guilty or I'm saying we all have idols. Mm -hmm. I have idols. Mm -hmm. I'd see some of them and I try to bring them to the Lord and give them up. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen some of them yet. Even though mm -hmm. I've been a Christian for 40 plus years, I haven't seen some of them yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I maybe more than 40 plus years. I, I, I got to start adding now that I'm older. But, uh, 
And, and I think it's just honest to say that. I mean, you mm-hmm. look at the children of Israel and how quickly they return to their idols. It's just a reminder to us of the human heart and how we need to constantly keep bringing this back to God and saying, God, what are the idols in my life? What are the things that I'm putting ahead of you to get what I want? How, how are the ways I'm trying to manipulate my relationship with you to get what I want instead of what, what you want to be doing in my life? Mm-hmm. Wow. And, I, you know, one of the great things that helps me with idols is to realize they're silly. I mean, just <laughs> like just like the I, they're powerful and they're scary. I get that. Mm-hmm. But they're also silly, like the little idol on the shelf. Somebody really trusts that they're going to have good crops because they put that on their shelf. That's silly. And our idols are just as silly. You know, that I really trust it because I do this, you know, this and this. And they're superstitious rather than supernatural. And uh, so obviously they don't have any, Mm. they have power over me. And they have power uh, because Satan is real and alive, Mm -hmm. but they don't have a greater power than God, obviously. They're tiny little silly things compared to God. (laughs) So going back to the Bible, what, what do we do when... There may be two groups of believers or two individual believers or groups, whatever it is, um, who who refer back to the Bible as as truth, but then but they come down on two very different sides of an issue. Both point to the Bible, but they end up on opposite ends of the track. <laughs> well, I, I think probably several people listening right now uh i remember in augustine's old statement because it's what we talk about when we hear this uh, (laughs) in essentials unity and non-essentials liberty and in all things charity so Mm -hmm. in the essential beliefs about jesus the core beliefs about the cross and our salvation we have unity in Mm non-essential beliefs we have liberty and in all things we have love towards each other as we talk about these things we have charity towards each other Uh, The Bible actually does talk about what to do when Christians disagree. There's quite a bit about it. Uh, One of the things it says again and again is don't argue. Mm -hmm. If you find yourself arguing with another believer in in an argument, there's just scripture after scripture that says don't don't do that. Don't get caught up in that. So the minute I start arguing, I know I'm trying to win my case. I've already lost the war. Even Mm -hmm. if I win my case, I've lost the war. Because in the arguing itself, my unity with that other believer is being damaged. It doesn't say don't discuss. It, it doesn't say talk about, don't talk about the fact you have differences of opinion. But if that discussion is turning into an argument, you need to say, hey, hey, look, we got to take a pause here. <laughs> you know, we need some time to think about this and then come back and mm-hmm. talk when you can when you can discuss it rather than argue about mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Bible talks a lot about uh, some things we might disagree about and the weaker brother or sister and the stronger brother or sister in faith. And if mm-hmm. there's somebody who's weaker in faith than you are, you know, there's, they're a fairly new Christian or they haven't grown much or they haven't really learned about that issue yet. And you feel like I'm stronger in the faith. The Bible says that in humility, we're to consider that weaker person, mm-hmm. always consider mm-hmm. that weaker person. So if you have freedom in Christ to take a drink uh, when you go out to a restaurant, but you know, you're going out with somebody who isn't really sure about that yet. They're a brand new believer. Maybe they're in recovery. Even that makes it even easier. If you know, they're in recovery, uh, <laughs> then you go, I'm not going to drink at this meal. Why? Because yeah. you don't have the freedom to drink. No, because you love and all things charity. You, you love mm. that person and you just make mm. that decision. And if yeah. me saying that just now, if you're listening and you feel like I'd never do that, I have the right to take a drink. I just want to say to you, you've made an idol of mm. your rights. Just be mm. careful, be careful, because if you can't choose to love a fellow believer who's struggling because you have to hold on to your rights, whew, something's <laughs> really something's really gone wrong, and there needs to be a moment of clarity between you and the Lord on that. I'm not going to convince anybody on that, but I believe if you'll listen to the Lord, if you're having these feelings right now, I believe he can convince you. Mm. Wow. Wow, that's, <laughs> that's powerful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so as we as we think about turning to the Bible as our source of truth, what about when we come up to something that the Bible seems silent on? Like we don't know what the Bible's direction should be on. You know, like we're saying, okay, well, I'm going to go to the Bible. This is my source of truth, but I don't feel like it's addressing the issue that I'm dealing with. Then what truths can we hold on to or trust in when we when the Bible doesn't seem to speak to what 
we're dealing with? Like when we're saying, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. You know, when, when I talk to Linda, when I talk to people about that, the first thing I always talk about is, well, let's first check and see, are you trying to be faithful to do as much as you know of what mm-hmm. the Bible is telling you to do? Right. You know, somebody comes to me and says, I, the Bible's silent to me on all these issues. And I say, well, you know, I mean, tell me what happens when you go to church, you know, how are you feeling <laughs> when you pray? And they go, I don't go to church. You know, I stopped going to church uh, eight months ago. What? And I, and I go, well, wait, the Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. How are you assembling with other believers? And they mm-hmm. start saying, no, it's just me and Jesus now. <laughs> well, how are you going to know if you're not mm-hmm. doing the things that God has told you to already do? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so because when you do the things that God has already told you to do, a couple of things happen. I, I could talk about a lot of them. Let me just talk about two of them. When I do the things that God's told me to do, it tells me to hang around other believers. Right. You know, I need to be in good fellowship with other believers. I need to be in a church. And the truth is, on a lot of those things that the Bible is silent on, I'm going to pick up some cues from other believers Mm -hmm. that I trust in my life to help me to know. Uh, The Bible is silent on your career. The Bible is silent on the name of the person. If you're not married yet, the name of the person that you're going to marry. (laughs) You you can read all through the Bible. I mean, mean, if you're going to marry somebody named Mary, I know Mary's name (laughs) is in the Bible, but it's not like you read the name and go, duh, that's it. That's who I'm supposed to marry. I'm supposed to marry Mary. No, the Bible is silent on that, on that name of that person. But there are some people who can love and know you, other believers Mm-hmm. who can help you as you're figuring out your career, as you're helping to figure out whether you should move or not. And you talk to them and they they give you some input. Uh, I, I really believe uh, many times people think, well, there's only one perfect career for me. I, I don't happen to think that way. I ha- happen to think uh, that there are maybe 10 different things God could bless you in doing based mm-hmm. on the gifts that he's given you. Uh, and you're going to choose one of those. The question is, are you going to do all the other things that the Bible is really clear on in doing that one thing? Right. You know, because mm-hmm. the question isn't what career do you have so much for me as a pastor is, are you loving the people that are around you right. in the career that you have? Are you right. seeking to let them know about the love of Jesus Christ? Are you uh, have an integrity in your work and whatever career that you have? That's the key, mm-hmm. you know, and so that starts to help us make some decisions, the people that we have in our lives. But the other big thing that when, when you start doing the things that the Bible tells us to do, the Bible talks a lot about spending time with God. Mm-hmm. And so how do you know what God wants? You spend more time with him. Yeah. And the more time you spend with him, the more you get a sense of his direction in your life. Now, you're always going to need other people in your life. You're always going to need God's word in your life. It's not like you get to this place where, okay, I got it figured out. You know, every time I hear this voice in my head, it's always God's voice and it's always right. No, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but the more time you spend with the Lord through your life, the more you're going to start to have this sense of we should move now. And here's, here's some reasons for it. It's going to be good for me. It's going to challenge my faith. It's going to be, it's actually going to be good for my kids. I I see some opportunities in their life that aren't going to happen if we don't, if we don't make this move now. It's Mm -hmm. um, God's given us some things that have happened in our our circumstances lately that have just sort of given us a release of freedom from some responsibilities that we have here. And there's a reason maybe that he did that. So you Mm -hmm. start to see that happening when you're spending time with the Lord, but you can't, you can't wait until the hard decision comes to spend time with the Lord. Right. You can't, that's like in a marriage waiting until things get in trouble and then telling your husband or wife, Oh, we got to spend more time with each other. If you've been yeah. spending more time with each other all along, you wouldn't have gotten to that point. Right. And when you say it, when you're desperate, the person feels that you're desperate. And God knows your desperate heart. God, God mm-hmm. knows. Do you really mean this? Are you mm-hmm. really going to start spending time with me now? Or are you just trying to get back to everything being okay? Yeah. And so my encouragement is whatever circumstance of life you're in right now, the way you trust God more is you spend more time with him because mm-hmm. he, is, he is trustworthy. Mm-hmm. And when you read his word and you listen to him and you talk back to him, that sense of trust in God is going to increase and increase and increase. It can't help but increase because that's who God is. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's good. And then Tom, in in a similar vein, what is your encouragement for people who, you know, have placed their trust in what the Bible says, 
in acting, you know, have, have, at least to the best of their ability, they have been following what the Bible says. Um, but things don't turn out the way that they expect or hope to. And they just feel like maybe life just keeps piling on against them. You know, how in that point, what is some advice in, for people or encouragement for people to maintain their confidence and their ability to trust the Bible when it seems like, well, I've tried, I tried that and it didn't work out well for me. <laughs> you know, I've been, uh, Jason, I've been talking to a friend at church, like for the last three months about this. Mm -hmm. I see him about every other week and uh, he's going through a lot of struggles mm -hmm. and uh, a wonderful person, uh, great countenance, but just, mm -hmm. uh, and, and just this sense of, I've, I've really been trying, but things aren't working out for me in my career struggles in my, my family mm -hmm. and uh, the humility to say, I know I've created maybe some of these things myself, but I know I haven't created some of these things myself, just yeah. to be honest. <laughs> and it's other people's choices that have caused some of these things to happen. So how do you keep, keep trusting God in that circumstance? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I'm talking to him about the truth of heaven I think mm -hmm. it's really important in those moments to recognize this life is not all there is. Uh, our American culture is a winning culture. You're mm -hmm. supposed to win at the end of the game. And mm -hmm. for us, many times the end of the game is the end of the day or <laughs> the end of, you know, the school year or the end of the season or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's good for us to remind ourselves as Christians that the end of the quote unquote game is heaven and yeah. it's not a game it's life and the fact that you're struggling in this life has nothing to do with what's going to happen in your life for all of eternity i hate that you're struggling if you're going through that right now i wish that you weren't but i and we all know we read the stories over thousands of years of faithful christians who have mm -hmm. trusted god through difficult times and god has used them even though their lives have not been pleasant their lives have not been good their lives have been godly. Their lives have been lives of, of trusting in God. And uh, even, even for many of them, their voices still speak today in ways that they would have never, never anticipated. So we, we talk about the truth of heaven and how important that is. It's very important. Uh, but it's also important to have this humility about ourselves in these moments mm -hmm. uh, where I recognize, okay, Lord, I, I know it's not all me, but what is me? You know, mm -hmm. what, what is it that you want to do in my life? And the problem when things aren't going good is I start to blame myself. I start to pile it on. I get mad at myself. Mm -hmm. And there's no good result out of that <laughs> that's going to happen out of that. Uh, how can I get to a place where I can just be honest to God about who mm -hmm. I am and know that he loves me no matter what? He's going to be with me no matter what. He's going to strengthen me no matter what. But he can also show me a next step to take. He can show mm -hmm. me a next step to take that can maybe not make my life better, but can mm -hmm. head my life in the path that he wants. If I could have that, Lord, and if you could show that to me. And I, I know in doing that, what people want is, okay, I'll do that. Could I have a sign? You know, just mm -hmm. something that would <laughs> yeah. happen in my life that would just make me. And God often gives that. He'll give you some verse that you read or something you hear in a sermon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, he often gives that, but he doesn't always give that. And when he doesn't, when it seems like God is silent, just remember that God is trusting you with that silence. Mm. He's trusting you with it. Obviously, mm -hmm. God could speak more than anyone in the universe. But you read the Psalms, David often talks about God being silent, the sense that God is not speaking. He knew that that wasn't true. But he didn't feel that God was there in that moment. And so he yeah. trusted him even in those moments of silence. Well, you know, if I woke up every morning and there was a beautiful rainbow right in front of my door, <laughs> nobody else's door, just my door, you know, yeah, and awesome. I mean, as long as we got the rainbow, let's put a pot of gold at the bottom of the rainbow and my door. Every If that happened to me every single morning, I'd be trusting in the rainbow and the pot of gold. Mm, I'd be trusting mm -hmm. in the visible signs. And there are times, sometimes long times in our lives, where we trust God without signs. And God's trusting you with that. And your faith is developing. If you're going through that right now, your faith is developing in that time in ways that you could never imagine that are going to be reflected in heaven and in all of eternity. Uh, God is strengthening spiritual muscles and heart for him in your life that 
it's almost beyond beyond description. So mm. if life's not working out for you, I just want to remind you, and the Bible does say this again and again, the people that seem like the winners in this life are not the winners. Mm. They're not. Because the, the, they're winning based on money or popularity or whatever. What, what, what we're looking at is not winners and losers. What we're looking at is those who are loved by the Lord. Mm-hmm. This relationship that we have with him. And uh, knowing that you're loved by him and hanging on to that, that's what you hang on to today, uh, even though life is not working out as you would have wished that it were worked out. And our heart is with you. And you need to get other people around you. Don't go through this alone uh, who can pray with you and strengthen you. And you can pray with them and their struggles so that you're helping other people in their struggles. That's one of the greatest things we can do when we're struggling is um, remind ourselves that God wants to still use me in other people's lives who are struggling. The fact that you're struggling doesn't mean you can't help other people that are struggling. In fact, it means you can better help other people who are struggling because you understand Mm -hmm. what they're going through. Yeah. Hmm. And Tom, I wanted to um, wrap up our conversation by just asking if there was anything that you wanted to tell people or share with people, encourage people who are at this point point that we talked about in, in our first episode in this series of just confusion of, I don't know what to trust anymore. It just feels like there's, there's people on this side that are yelling at me to not trust this side and vice versa. It just see, and then there's all these people who are just kind of in the middle saying like, I just feel like I'm in the middle of this, of, of, of this battle of trust and truth going on. And I don't know what, uh, what to do. What is, is there, is there just a final word that you want to give people who are kind of just in this? You know, I I think this is for myself too. I think for all of us right now, um, what life is telling us is it's, if we're going to live the life that God has for us, we have to get our eyes off of what's happening in the moment. Mm -hmm. And we have to get our eyes on what God is doing in eternity. Mm -hmm. Because everything in our culture right now, all the media, all the talk, all the social media, it's increasingly forcing our eyes to the moment, what's happening in this moment, what's mm-hmm. going wrong in this moment. And honestly, when, you know, in, in your house, if, um, you know, this week I was working with a water uh, faucet, old water faucet, and the handle came off and the water just <laughs> spurted me right in the chest. <laughs> All I had a heart for in that moment was the moment. I didn't really notice anything else. I wasn't thinking, <laughs> well, God, what are you doing in heaven in eternity? So I, I, had to, I had to turn the water off first. So I get that if you have a personal crisis. But a lot of the crises that we're facing right now aren't personal crises. They're the crises all around the world and all around our country. And the, the, the moments are just piling on us in a way to keep us from seeing what God's doing in eternity. So I got to get through the personal crises. And I think, you know, we've been hearing this advice more and more at church from more and more pastors because we Mm -hmm. see what's happening. Uh, I got to get my eyes off of the crises that are being created by all the media that's around me, social Mm -hmm. media, traditional media, all the media, Mm -hmm. so that I have time to see God's an eternal God. Mm -hmm. God's doing something that's headed towards eternity. I'm going to be with him for all eternity. He's doing something in my heart and my life that's preparing me for all of that eternity. That's Mm -hmm. what this life is all about. It's not about the moment. Mm -hmm. It's about the the sovereign God, the sovereignty of God and what he's doing in all of our lives. So I think that's the, for our times, if we're going to trust God, that's crucial. Otherwise we're going to just have our eyes on the next crises Mm -hmm. and we're going to go through another Mm -hmm. whole year and think, I never really took the time to trust God. I just went from crises to crises to crises. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's perfect. Thank you, Tom. Tom, thank you for being here. Thank you for joining in this conversation on trust. Uh, friends who are listening, um, I really hope that you take some time to just sit and reflect on what Tom was saying there, because there's just so much wisdom in even mm-hmm. in, in every every little bit, go back and listen to this whole thing again. I think that would be a value to you. <laughs> Do that. Um, <laughs> um, friends, we appreciate you. Uh, we are looking forward to being back with you again uh, next Tuesday for uh, our next part of this conversation on trust.
If you enjoyed this episode, consider giving us a rating or review on iTunes. If you do, you'll help other people find us in the future. You can also listen to these episodes on YouTube. Just subscribe to the Saddleback Church YouTube channel for these conversations, plus lots of other video content. And if you are already listening to us on YouTube, subscribe to the Doable Discipleship Podcast on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app so you can listen in the car or wherever else you go. Don't forget to visit saddleback.com slash doable to check out all of our previous episodes. And go to saddleback.com slash grow to find spiritual growth resources and view a calendar of upcoming events. Lastly, you can always get in touch with us by emailing maturity at saddleback.com. Send us your thoughts, send us your questions, your Bible questions, your life questions, whatever. Who knows? Your question might just inspire an upcoming episode. Thanks again for tuning in to Doable Discipleship. I'm Jason Whelan, and I hope you'll join us again next week. Music